Well, good morning. And welcome to Bethel. Welcome to all of you, whether you're a longtime, lifetime member or first time visitor, whether you're here in present person or whether you're listening by the internet or by radio, we welcome all of you together as we worship our God. This morning, as a congregation, we have a couple special words of welcome. First, we're going to be doing the baptism today in the Kruger family, and so if you are here for Cayenne, we're thankful that you're here, and we want to welcome you to this service as we, together with you, celebrate God's covenant promise. As a congregation, we also don't just welcome a new baptized member today, we welcome new uh, members who are joining us, and I'd like to invite a member of the hospitality up to welcome that new couple. Yeah, this morning we have the opportunity to welcome uh, Kyle and Kara Lindbergh, and I'll ask them to join me up here, if, wherever they're at. Kyle and Kara actually uh, started going to Bethel when they were in college at Dort, and um, recently, since returning to the area, have um, decided to join us again, and um, today we officially welcome them as members. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle, and maybe just tell us a little bit about you guys, uh, where you grew up, and um, what you do now currently, um, just uh, maybe what some of your hobbies are, and what led you to Bethel. Thanks, Travis. Like Travis said, I'm Kyle. This is my wife, Kara. Uh, Kara's originally from Leota, Minnesota, about an hour from here. Uh, I'm originally from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We both attended Dort, met at Dort. Uh, we got married after Dort. Uh, after we attended Dort, we moved to uh, Australia for two years, uh, where we lived there, and then moved back to Sioux Falls for a year, and then we've been in Sioux Center this past year. Uh, I work at Dort. I coach assistant men's basketball coach, and Kara works at Interstates, where she works with the administrative assistance team with the estimators. So uh, we both enjoy preparing for a new baby in November. So uh, we're open to any advice for those parents. Um, but we are, yeah, that consumes a lot of our time. Basketball, we love going to Dort sporting events uh, and anything that has to do with outdoors as long as it's warm. So uh, we're thankful for Bethel and uh, being able to come back after college uh, and just the community membership, the fellowship uh, that is offered here is, is really what's drawn us back. Um, being able to jump right back in, it's almost like we never left. So we're very thankful for that. And I think, Pastor John, we maybe have found somebody who can match your length and uh, energy level on the basketball court. So, <laughs> but we're just uh, thankful that uh, once again, you guys have found your home here in the community at Bethel. And um, we just pray that the spirit will continue to work in you guys as you grow your family here. So would you join me in welcoming the Lindberghs? You. Um, we welcome new members. If you're trying to get to know each other and you're saying like, what were their names again? Uh, Kyle and Kara. So we're inviting you this month to put on name tags and just to spend these weeks getting to know one another a little bit better. We also want to get to know God better. And this is the beginning of our church education year. And I'd like to invite two people who are going to explain a little bit of what adult education is before us. So. Show of hands, who takes a daily vitamin? One a day men's, prenatals, fish oils. So the discipleship team has been talking about ways that we can continue to equip uh, not only our children uh, who are starting Sunday school and catechism today, but also uh, once you get out of high school that we can have some faith growth opportunities for you as well. There's some information in your bulletin under faith vitamins. Uh, we ask that you consider these prayerfully. We're going to be offering short uh, cl classes, sessions, work stops, uh, devotional times throughout the year. And so we just ask that you consider those. If you're interested, sign up in the back. Uh, just a brief overview of some of the opportunities. Uh, I'm going to be leading a class on spiritual gifts. If you would like to uh, discern and learn about uh, what your spiritual gifts are and how you can deploy them, uh, we will be going through an eight-week study. There's also going to be a midweek parent study for uh, a, a movie called Like Arrows. Uh, that's based then on the study material of the art of parenting. So... Uh, parents, new parents, expectant parents uh, are welcome to attend that. And then um, we also have one on prayer. The Word of God says, commit yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So that's what we're going to do for five weeks. Um, and we're going to meet in the prayer room. If you don't know where the prayer room is, it's as you enter the educational wing, we're right to the right. It's the first door on the right. And uh, I want to invite each of you to come. It doesn't matter if you're in high school or college age or adult, senior adult. Uh, we're just going to spend five weeks 
five Sundays right after the morning service in prayer, committing and experiencing God's power and the work in his word uh, based on prayer. And we're going to watch him, his transforming power in, at work in our families and in our individual selves and in our church. So come join me September 30th, right after the morning worship service. Yeah, for those who don't know, that's uh, Kim Forseth, and then Dan is our youth pastor here at Bethel. So we, we're thankful for their leadership. Later in the service, we're actually going to be commissioning the many people who are going to be involved in discipling from youth to old age, and we're going to commission them with God's blessing today. And that's one of the things that is before us this morning. So those words of announcement, one, one final one. If you uh, are a singer, choir will start right after the service today. They'll be the first practice. And so if you are, you sing bass or tenor or alto or soprano or like me, just sing whatever, you're welcome to, to come and just to join that, that ministry of music that will lead us throughout this year. So with those things before us today, let's quiet our hearts and bow our heads and ask for God to be with us in a special way. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you search us and that you know us. You know when we sit and when we rise. Lord, even in those times of life when we find ourselves on the far side of the sea, even there you are with us and you know us deeply. And so, Father, in this month when we try to get to know one another's names, as we seek to grow and to learn about you as children, as young adults, as uh, those at the end of our lives, all through life as we seek to grow in knowing about you, Lord, we thank you that this begins with the assurance that you already know us and that in Christ you have loved us and forgiven us and that you are the one who has welcomed each of us here today, that we are here not by accident, but by your calling. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would move among us today, that you would be honored by the songs that we bring, that you would listen to the prayers that we lay before your throne and that you would speak to us. For Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? On this warm September morning, our call to worship comes to us uh, from the book of Psalms, Psalm 32. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, you upright in heart. The psalmist says we have a God who guides us, who watches over us, and that calls forth song. Let's sing together an old hymn, Guide Me. Oh, my great Redeemer, number 543, stands at one through three. our great Redeemer who has guided us to this place, the one who knows us, brings this word of greeting. 
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. Would you please turn and greet those around you, and if they have a name, take greet them by name, please, this morning. Okay. or in want, whether we are productive for the Lord or not, God calls us to himself with these words from Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart.
Luke 19, Jesus spoke of Zacchaeus, a sinner like us. Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. that God's grace abounds in us individually and corporately is through his promise. And that promise comes to us today through his gift of baptism. We, with churches around the world of all denominations, baptize believers and their children in response to the command that Jesus gave when he ascended into heaven and he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then this promise, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the promise, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. And in response to that command, and with the assurance of that promise, we baptize believers and their children. To reflect on what this is today, I'm going to read the words of the church in Psalter Hymnal, page 960. The instruction of what baptism is, is that we hear these words, let's reflect on what this gift means for us today. Let us recall the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our sin by the blood of Christ and the renewal of our lives by the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. From this we learn that our sin has been condemned by God, that we are to hate it and consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, the water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. From this we learn that we are to walk with Christ in newness of life. All this tells us that God has adopted us as his children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thus in baptism, God seals the promises he gave when he made his covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust for life and death in Christ our Savior, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him in obedience and love. God graciously includes our children in his covenant and all his promises are for them as well as us. Jesus himself embraced little children and blessed them. And the Apostle Paul said that the children of believers are holy. So just as children of the old covenant receive the sign of circumcision, our children are given the sign of baptism. We are therefore always to teach our little ones that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children. That reminder of the teaching of baptism, would you please pray with me? Father in heaven, we pray that you would never destroy us in our sin as with the flood. But that you would save us as you save believing Noah and his family. And spare us as you spare the Israelites who walk safely through the sea. We pray that Christ who went down into the Jordan and came up to receive the Spirit. Who sank deep into death and was raised up the Lord of life. Will always keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. We pray, O oh Holy Father, that your spirit will separate us from sin and openly mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. Prepare us now, O oh Lord, to respond with glad hope to your promises so that we and all entrusted to our care may drink deeply from the well of living water. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite Blake and Tasha up now. This reminder of what baptism is. We'll just gather here on the font.
like Natasha, it seems like it wasn't that long ago that you're here with Jade, uh, and now you're back. And I want to just uh, invite you to respond again to these same four questions, these vows before God and his people. So first of all, do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Blake and Tasha, what is your answer? Next, do you affirm the promises of God made to you and to your children in his word and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and taught in this church of Christ? Next, do you believe that your son, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And then finally, do you, in promise and reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help and the nurture of the church, to instruct your son by word and example in the truth of God's word and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. What is your answer? It's God. And so God comes to us with a promise through water. Yeah. Do, you want to, do you remember this? We're going to get your... Put some water on your brother, and that's God's promise to him. And he made that promise to you, too. Kyan John Kruger, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Kyan John, child of the covenant and baptism, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Friends, would you pray with us? Gracious God, we thank you that you are a God who searches and knows us even before we are born, for you are the one who knits us together in our mother's womb. But we thank you that you knew Cain before we knew him. And even now, as you have made this promise to him, we pray that he would grow to know you. That he would grow through the community of faith here at Bethel and even through the broader body of Christ to be discipled in the way of Christ. That your spirit would set him apart, that you would give wisdom to these parents that Blake and Tasha would experience as they raise this growing family, that it is your strength that they lean on, that it is your spirit that guides them as they guide their children. Father, we pray these things with thanksgiving and in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Congregation, we're going to make a promise. Could you please stand if you're able? We receive Kyan into Christ's church. Do you welcome him in love? And you promise to pray for him and to support him in his growth in Christ by your word and example. Congregation, what is our answer? We do, God helping us. Amen. You may be seated. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. We're now going to hear uh, Be Thou My Vision. We're going to hear stanza one sung as a solo by Blake's sister. And then we're going to join in stanzas two through four of Be Thou My Vision.
turn with me in Scripture, we are in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, and we're in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Just a few verses this morning on a busy morning. If you're a guest with us, we are in this fall season walking verse by verse through a portion of Scripture. That portion of Scripture is in the Old Testament, and it focuses on the life of a prophet of God named Elisha. Not Elijah, the more famous one who was before him, but Elisha. And we saw how this ordinary man on an ordinary day had an unexpected call to follow and began an adventure of following. That was the first. And we saw that was a paradigm of all who hear Christ's command to lay down our nets and to follow him. And then we saw last week that even in a time of transition and grief and change, God faithfully provides a new mantle. And we see how in our world today, God is still at work faithfully providing for his people. And now we begin this amazing life of Elisha, this kind of first story after that calling process. And that is again in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Before we read it, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that these things that we read were written as encouragements and also as warnings. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your spirit who inspired the writers of Scripture is the same spirit who now speaks to us in this place, in this time. We pray that you would open our hearts and our ears to hear from you. Lord, that it be your word alone that we hear this morning. You would cover even the sanctuary with the blood of Jesus, and that even as we hear, we would be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 19, that's page 337 in our Pew Bibles. The men of the city said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, the town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and when he went out to the spring and threw salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, if you follow the news at all the past few years, you probably have heard of a city in Michigan named Flint. Anyone hear of Flint, Michigan? If you've heard of it, probably, in fact, if you just were watching Miss America last week Sunday, Miss Michigan introduced herself referring to what happened in Flint just last Sunday evening. If you're not familiar with the story, in 2014, the city of Flint changed its water source from Lake Huron to the Flint River. But they failed to fully treat that water, and so the new water corroded the pipes in the city, which were from the 1920s, releasing a toxic neurotoxin, lead, into the water stream, poisoning 100,000 people. Some died from developing a disease called Legionnaire's disease, but other studies showed that fertility was dropped by 12%, and that fetal death increased by 58%. It was a tragedy in an American city. And the cause was bad water. That's what the cause of all this pain was, bad water. And we think of what happened in Flint, and then we read this very ancient story, this 21st century news report, and then this 8th century BC biblical text, and we see that in some ways this is an easy text for us 21st century Americans to understand. We understand about pollution, we understand how water can cause death and unproductivity and miscarriage. And we read in verse 1 of this text that same thing. The men of the city said to Elisha, Look, Lord, our town is well situated. Hey, we're on the Great Lakes, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. We can understand the problem of this text. And maybe we think we also understand a simple application. And this text is warning us of the dangers of municipal water pollution. And we need to be more careful and more environmentally conscious. Maybe that's what this text is for. Except for, though, the problem is very 21st century, the solution is not. Because the way that this problem is dealt with is a a prophet of God takes some salt, and he goes up to this fouled spring, and he sprinkles some salt in it, and suddenly the water is okay to drink. And maybe if you've come to church, and you haven't for a while, and you hear a story like that, you say, no, that's why I don't understand the Bible. I understand about polluted water, but putting salt in it, what, what's the application for me? Do I have to take a salt shaker around? What in the world does this mean for us 21st century Americans? And if you're wondering that about this story today, 
I want to remind you what I've said many times from this pulpit. The Bible is not a collection of individual stories. The Bible is one great story. And so today we are invited to see how this little story fills in and intersects with that bigger story. So what's going on in 2 Kings 2? Well, if we first have to look at the text and figure out where this is happening. Verse 19 said, the men of that city said to Elisha. Now what city? Well, look at the verse before, verse 18. They returned to Elisha who was staying in Jericho. The city is Jericho. Now, what do we know in the big story of Scripture about Jericho? Well, remember, Elisha has just crossed the Jordan, referring us back to an earlier time when that happened, when another mantle was passed to a man named Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 2, at the very beginning of that chapter, we see this is what happened. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially, and then we meet this place, especially Jericho. If you're familiar with that story, the spies go over there, they're undercover, or under the covers because they go to a prostitute named Rahab. Then they come back, they tell about the city. Israel crosses the Jordan just as Elisha will many years later. And in silence, they march around the city of Jericho. And then the next day, they do that again in silence. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. Until the seventh day, they march around not just once, but seven times. And then seven priests blow seven trumpets. We pick up the story in chapter six of Joshua. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and they destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. This takes place in Jericho. And Jericho was a place that was absolutely destroyed by God's righteous judgment. And why was it destroyed? Well, this judgment was actually long in coming. Back in in, in the book of Genesis, chapter 15, God tells a man named Abraham, I'm going to have you have descendants They're going to go in exile for 400 years, but wait. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites. That's the people in Canaan. Jericho's people has not yet reached its full measure. They are sinning, but I won't judge them until that sin gets even greater. Joshua comes when the sin is at its greatest. Deuteronomy chapter 9. It is not because of your righteousness, this is speaking to Israel, or your integrity that you're going to take possession of their land, But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham. God is judging Jericho because for generations, sin has been building there. And so now after generations of sin, in Joshua's day, they are judged and they are utterly destroyed, but they aren't just destroyed in that moment. Joshua 6 goes on to say this. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. Generations of sin built to its destruction. But now a curse lies on that city for generations to come. Now the time of Joshua was some 550 years before the time of Elisha. Elisha, of course, followed Elijah. Now, Bible quiz, Elijah ruled or was a judge during the time of what queen and king? The queen was Jezebel. The king was, anyone know? Ahab. What happened in the time of Ahab, the time then of Elijah and Elisha? Well, let's look in 1 Kings 16. In Ahab's time, this is the time of Elijah, right before Elisha's ministry. In this very time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of his firstborn son. He set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. This curse has hung over the city for 550 years. And now just before the ministry of Elisha, someone dared to violate that curse and they're just starting to build this city again. After 550 years, they're trying this new beginning And yet we find in our text that that ancient curse is still hanging over the city. And it's fouling the water 
and it's causing death. That language of being unproductive actually means to miscarry, and it's only used in the Old Testament, not about the land, but about people. The people are miscarrying. There's a curse. What the people of Jericho have discovered is this deep spiritual truth that we all drink downstream from generational sin. That we all drink downstream from generational sin. That the past poisons the present. That the ghost of the wicked before haunt the corridors of today. Now, at some level, even for 21st century Americans, we can understand that. Take, for example, the city of Flint. That crisis didn't happen in a day. It actually had been building for a generation. The city of Flint was ruled by a single party since the 50s. And because there was no real competition, corruption and mismanagement entered into that city until a few years ago, the city was bankrupt and it was in receivership, and the governor of the state of Michigan had to put emergency provisions in place because the city was imploding. This did not happen in a night. It was the sin of a generation of fathers who mismanaged their own city. And the new manager comes in to save money, orders the change of the water supply. Those who were supposed to be measuring it covered up and lied to the people. This is the sins of the father poured out in the sippy cups of the children. But it wasn't just the sins of that particular city's fathers. The population of Flint, Michigan is largely African American. It's not an accident that none of the white affluent cities in Michigan have ever had this problem. If you look at the city of Flint, what you see there is a reminder of an old stream of bitter water that is U.S. racial history. One um, account, you know, if you look at this picture, you can put that picture this is not so far away from what happened in the 50s in other cities, even in the South. And just this week in Time Magazine, an article on our racist soul said this, when I heard the echoes of 2 Kings 2, we evade the historical wounds, the individual pain and the lasting effects of it. The lynched relative, the buried son killed at the hands of police, the millions locked away in, to rot in prisons, the children languishing in failed schools, the smothering concentrated poverty passed down from generation to generation, to generation, we all drink downstream from generational sin. Now that's not just true at a municipal level, that's true at personal levels. I read this week of a man named Robert, and he was a man, if you knew anything about his family, you knew when he was born, he was not born to live long. Robert's parents divorced when he was just a young boy. His father was a pimp who worked the streets, abusive to women and to all around him. When Robert was eight years old, his father committed suicide. By 14, Robert had joined a gang. At 16, he was arrested for drive-by shooting. And the day that he went to prison, a rival gang in revenge murdered his mother. Three and a half months later, they murdered his stepfather. In prison, he learned the ways of people even worse than him. And when someone did some research in his family history, they found that this pattern of violence and abuse went back not just to his father, but to his grandfather and to the generation before. And we see in the story of Robert, the sins of the fathers visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. We see that we drink downstream from generational sin. That the past poisons our present. And it's not just Robert, is it? Some of us know, maybe in our own families, a grandfather who struggled with alcohol and a father who was an alcoholic, and now we struggle. We see in families those who've had abuse from one generation and the next generation does it again and again and these echoes of pain ripple through time and we don't know why and we feel powerless because the past is poisoning our present. Now, at some level, as 21st century Americans, we explain this. Some of it's genetic. Some of us pass on genes that are more prone to addictions. Some of it is socialization. People who see abusive patterns when they're modeled by their parents will redo those patterns in their own marriages. Some of it's simply that. But there's something else going on at times. It's maybe not as easy for 21st century people to understand. It's spiritual. When I was in college, God connected me with groups doing spiritual warfare. One of the concepts I became aware of is something called generational curses. That at times, not always, we can't be, but at times, evil spirits 
oppress us and they gain entry not through what we had done, but through what our parent or a grandparent has done. And they latch onto families, creating havoc and wake through rippling generations of time. And if that's a little bit too charismatic for you, how about Reformed theology? Because this is the story of Scripture, Romans chapter 5. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sin, death reigned from the time of our father, Adam. The story of Scripture is that we all drink downstream from generational sin, that the past has indeed poisoned all of our present, that the ghosts of the wicked before haunt the corridors of today. So Elisha, like Joshua before him, receives a mantle. And like Joshua before him, Elisha crosses the Jordan and it parts and he goes on dry ground. And like Joshua before him, Elisha goes first to Jericho. And there he encounters a 550-year-old curse. And what does God have his prophet do at the very beginning of his ministry? Well, he says, I want you to bring me a new bowl. Bring me a new bowl. New in Scripture, we see it in Leviticus, we see it in Numbers. When you do sacrifices, you bring something new because a sacrifice represents a clean break with the past, a fresh start. It reminds us that a new word can be spoken, that a new reality can enter in, that a new day can dawn. He says, don't just bring me a bull, bring me a new bull because a fresh start is about to happen. And then Elisha says, and put some salt in it. Bring me a new bull and put some salt in it. Why? Remember, friends, there is not stories. There is one story. Leviticus chapter 2. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. The salt of the covenant. Go to Numbers chapter 18. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give you and your sons and daughters as your regular share. It is an everlasting covenant of, say it with me, salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Don't you know the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? What is going on in Jericho? Bring me a new bowl, a fresh start, and then I'm going to remind you of something. The salt of the covenant. I'm going to remind you that this is a sign of God's faithfulness in spite of your unfaithfulness. That this is a sign of God's promise that endures from generation to generation. That the sin of the fathers is visited on the children to the third and fourth generation, but God will show his love to a thousand generations of those who obey his commands. How is the water healed at Jericho? Elisha doesn't do it. It's not magic nor pseudoscience. It's not the salt. Notice what happens. They, he puts the water in the spring and he said, this is what the Lord says. I, the Lord, have healed the water. The Lord of the covenant has turned the waters of death into the waters of life. The waters of cursing into the waters of blessing. The waters of miscarriage to the waters of new birth. That's the story of 2 Kings 2. 800 years later, Jesus comes on the scene. And he goes and he talks to a Samaritan woman. In other words, a Canaanite. And she is discussing with him. And, this, and he says to her, if you're, you want water, I will give you water that will spring up from you. I will quench your thirst. And then that was in chapter 4 and chapter 7. At the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stands and says, anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I will give you a different spring to drink from than the fouled one of your past, a different family to belong to, a different reality to enter into, a different day that will dawn. Drink not from that old spring, but from the new spring of the covenant in me. What about that old curse that comes all the way from, from Adam or from our grandfather? What about that? Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. He drank that bitter water so that now we can drink the sweet spring of life that comes from him. And we do that through the waters of the covenant. Bring me a bowl. 
and hear the promise of God that says to a little child or to a new believer, your past heritage is now changed. Your family name is changed. Your identity is changed. Your history is changed. And so now is your present and your future because in the waters of the covenant, we are made into something new. So Robert sat in prison until he was 20. And when he was 20, this young man with a dark past rippling back beyond his life had someone like an Elisha enter his life and give him a new story and explain the coming of this one named Jesus, the one who had taken away the sin of the world, who would take away even the curse of his family, who would even forgive the sin of his own life. And by the grace of God, Robert was able to come to the waters of the covenant and in baptism was given a new story, a new heritage, a new family, a new beginning. Friends, that is what God is offering us today, faithfully, even as we saw this morning in these waters. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have done in us. That the past no longer controls our future. You, in the name of Jesus, have broken off from us those old chains, the ancient curses, even the old curse that you said in Eden, that for all of us baptized into Jesus, we now belong to your family, that you are our Father and that Christ has become for us our righteousness. Father, we pray that for any of us who today feel still connected to the past, that you would help us to hear your word of new beginnings in Jesus. We pray this in his name and all of us say, amen. Let's stand to sing as the music begins, what the Lord has done in me. you may be seated and as you are let's come to our God through Jesus and prayer for our world and for this nation and for ourselves father we thank you that we can today sing Hosanna because Jesus has died and rose again 
And because of that, now these waters of baptism that we have witnessed have brought from us not death but life, not cursing but blessing, not spiritual miscarriage but new birth in Jesus to a new identity, to a new heritage, to new beginnings. Lord, we thank you that this is true for all of us who are in Christ Jesus. The past no longer can poison our present. But that rather we are like branches grafted into you, the true vine, with your life throwing through us to bear much fruit. That we are the thirsty who are invited to come and drink deeply from you the well of living water. Heavenly Father, as a congregation, we thank you for the signs of your faithfulness we've celebrated today. We thank you again with Blake and Tasha and their families for the gift of Kai and John and for the way that you've promised to him in the waters of your covenant this new beginning. Lord, we're thankful with Kyle and Kara for bringing them to us and for the way that you have shaped them to serve this body. And Lord, we pray that you would shape us as a congregation to walk beside and to serve them as their family grows, that together we would walk this road of obedience with joy in the times of pleasure, but also with perseverance together in times of suffering. And Lord, that we do not walk alone. Lord, we thank you for the way that we could celebrate as a congregation with Tabitha Zomerman and Demery Hill. Yesterday in the sanctuary, they're joining together as husband and wife. We pray your blessing on this new marriage. Lord, even as they celebrate that they are not alone, may they be a reminder to us that this marriage is even just a model of Christ's love for his church, this family of faith of which we are all are a part. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you as a, have used our congregation in this week and the different callings you've placed us in schools and offices and farms and businesses. Lord, even how you used so many this week as volunteers covering silage piles to raise funds for Christian education in this very tangible way of living out that promise that we just made to Kyan to help him grow in the knowledge of Christ. Lord, we're thankful this day as we prepare to commission new Sunday school teachers and cadet and gyms leaders and young people's leaders and all those who work in discipleship ministries in this new season, that you are the God who passes on the mantle of teaching. You are the teacher who leads us and gives us words. That you are the one who forms our hearts with compassion and care for all that you would bring us to learn beside. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for missionaries who've gone out from this place. We pray again for Ronaldo and Yesenia and our farmer to farmer partners in Nicaragua in a time of unrest in that country. Lord, we thank you that you sent out many volunteers, including Alan Van Beek, to volunteer with Hurricane Florence on the East Coast, and we pray your blessing on them and also on all who are recovering from those storms. May you give your mercy and a quick recovery and patience as we wait. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray in our congregation for those who have felt the pain of generational sin, even through abuse, in their own families or in institutions of our community. And Lord, as we cry out, for healing and for justice, we pray that you would continue to lead us as individuals and as a body. And Lord, we continue to look to you as the one who alone can heal these wounds in our souls. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the healing that you gave physically to Priscilla Brooke, that she was able to return home after a battle with pneumonia. We thank you again with Neil and Patty Van Scowen for uh, just a great report for their sister Joanne that she does not have cancer. And Lord, we just rejoice in this even as we pray that you would continue now to shepherd her recovery. We continue to lay before you Herm Brenneman and Adeline, that you would walk beside Herm as he continues to battle cancer. Lord, that you would continue to give him a sense of your nearness even this morning. We continue to pray with Merlin and Bev Zwart for their son-in-law Heath and daughter Kayla as they battle cancer as well in Heath's body. Lord, may this young family know the peace that passes understanding even as we pray for them. Father, we do pray for that same peace for those who grieve and we stand with the family of Sally Wasink even as they gathered around her grave yesterday morning, may we now look to the heavens and recognize the coming of Christ to make all things new. And even now to celebrate that Sally and Aaron are in your presence. Father, we do lay before you those who struggle in our community with spiritual oppression, with addictions, with deep loneliness, with problems in relationships with parents and between spouses and with coworkers, with all the ways that sin infects our lives. We pray that as this reminder from Scripture today, this would be a week of new beginnings in Christ. Father, we pray this all in His name. Amen. Before we take our offering, now we're going to commission those who God's called in this church education year to disciple. And so I'd like to invite Dave Tinkenberg, who is our discipleship elder, and he'll be inviting up all who will be involved in those ministries too.
go. Okay, uh, as of uh, earlier this week, we kicked off our education year here at uh, Bethel with uh, young peoples and uh, gems and cadets. And tonight we, uh, or this morning, we get started with uh, catechism and Sunday school and taught church and children in worship. So I would like to take just a minute and have everybody who's involved in those ministries come forward. And that would involve, like I said, young peoples, both our junior high and our high school uh, leaders, if you could come forward, uh, cadets and GEMS counselors, all our Sunday school catechism teachers, helpers, and uh, Tot Church and Children Worship are in process right now, so we won't have all of them, but uh, anybody who is involved in that on a normal basis, come join us. And while they're coming up here, I'll just uh, reflect on a, a theme from our uh, training last week. Uh, we conducted some uh, Sunday school training. And then also at our last discipleship committee meeting, we talked a little bit about Pastor John's theme the last couple weeks of passing that mantle. And I guess that's what I see going on here, is we as adults, uh, we've passed, uh, we re have received from teachers and from our parents in the past a mantle, and that mantle's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's our responsibility now and our calling to pass that on to our children and to our grandchildren. So we have a large group here who have felt that call to do that, and I want to thank them all for, uh, for doing that for our kids and our grandkids. And uh, I'd like to go through a few stats here just real quick. Our Tot Church um, and Children in Worship uh, takes care of about 20 kids, and we have 30 leaders and helpers that rotate through that. I don't think they need 30 every, every service. <laughs> but um, also, and then Sunday school, um, 203 kids we have in that program this year. And 34 folks up here are going to help with that. Our GEMS program is um, 55 girls this year. And we have 16 counselors. Our cadet program is 60 boys with 13 counselors. And then our junior, our junior high youth group uh, is 23 young adults and seven leaders. And in our high school youth group, we now have 63 with 11 leaders. And a great problem to have, we ended up with, I think, 60% more kids showing up as freshmen this year. So we've added a couple, um, another uh, group of leaders uh, for that group as well. So that's a wonderful thing. So it would be great if I could have everybody come up and surround them, but logistically that's not possible. So let's do that spiritually as we reach out and uh, bless this group uh, in their work. Join me in prayer. Our dear Father, we thank you and praise you for another Sabbath day that we could come up to your house and hear your word proclaimed. We thank you for the gospel, which is so clearly laid out for us every Sunday. And dear Lord, we also thank you for the call of the kingdom, the call to pass on that mantle to our kids and to our grandkids. And Lord, we just thank you for that wonderful opportunity that we have here at Bethel in the form of uh, Sunday school and catechism and cadets to train up our children in the way they, they should go. Lord, we praise you for our children, the blessing of children in our lives, we praise you for the joy that uh, we have in watching them grow from, from little babes to uh, independent young adults in uh, such a short period of time. And dear Lord, we just, uh, we just thank you for that. Dear Lord, we bless our ask for your blessing on every parent in this congregation who has been called to raise their children. We know that that is a weighty responsibility. And dear Lord, we just ask that you'll give them wisdom and strength to do that. And dear Lord, we just thank you for the support that uh, we as parents have 
in the form of our community schools, our Christian schools, and the teachers, and the programs in place. We thank you for them. We thank you for their faithfulness to our children, but also for this group assembled behind us, dear Lord, who have accepted your call uh, to minister to our children. And we just ask that you will bless them. Get the, give them an overwhelming uh, gift of your Holy Spirit. Give them compassion for their children and their students. And give them wisdom and courage and strength. As parents, may we respect this group, come alongside this group, and support them. And may our, may our students also seek to respect this group and, and love their teachers. And dear Lord, may ultimately that be the, the case as well, that these teachers and helpers help in a sense of love for your covenant children. And now we just uh, ask again for a blessing on them in all that they do. And we pray this in the name of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may go back to your seats. Just to go back, you, if you're a guest with us, we, you heard our congregation promise at baptism to help raise those children. You see that promise being lived out through these individuals and so many others. Um, one of the form of baptism we read this morning had the, this prayer, prepare us now, O Lord, to respond with glad hope to your promises so that we and all entrusted to our care may drink deeply from the well of living water. That old prayer is our prayer as a congregation for all of us, young and old, to grow. As we do that, our, we'll give our gifts and our offerings. The first for the ministries of this congregation. The second for the ministry of Christian education, another way we live out our promise. And as we do, we'll sing together, build your kingdom here. Let's sing.
Friends, reminder, right after the service, Sunday school will be beginning, and so we invite all of your children to go to, to those classes. Adult Sunday school is going to be starting up in a couple of weeks, too, with some other classes, so I'll follow the bulletin. Because of Sunday school this morning, prayer time for groups is 6 through 10 will be tonight after the evening service. So if you're in our care concern group 6 through 10, your prayer time will be this evening. And with that, would you please stand to receive God's blessing. And as we seek to grow together, young and old, married and single, our closing song is Friends. May you grow in grace. But first, this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.